Unsolved. Episode 213, John Bonet Case, The John Fernie Timeline. The following soundbite is John Fernie answering the question about Patsy's phone call that morning after she called 911. My thoughts about Fernie's response. First, it surprises me that he doesn't remember that phone call. Then he stutters to answer, and then he finishes by saying that it was something different or was more involved or was much more serious when he got there. He didn't expect it to be that serious. And at approximately 6 a.m. in the morning, John Fernie got in his car. And it was dark out, and it was very cold, and it had snowed lightly that night. And when he got to the Ramseys, he went to the back alley and parked behind John Ramsey's house. And then he went to a clear glass door that leads into the kitchen to get into the Ramsey's house. But that door was locked. My thoughts about this is John Fernie must have been told there was a ransom note or there was a kidnapping because why would he park in the back like that? I guess it's possibly just parked in the back out of routine or something. And then next... I got the feeling that Patsy might have hung up on him also. She just said what was going on and then she hung up the phone. And that's why he came over. I drove my car into the, up the alley and parked in the back of your house and went around to the patio door which was a glass door leading into the kitchen in back of the house. and didn't see anybody, but saw a piece of paper lying on the floor. Looked at that. It was facing the other direction. Read it, and after the first few lines, realized something very strange was happening. And so I ran around to the front of the house and knocked on the door and was let in. I didn't pick it up. It was inside the door and I was outside. The door was locked. I read it through the door. My thought here is I can't believe that the ransom note is just lying there on the kitchen floor after 10 or 15 minutes. I'm just totally confused by that. Also, it's kind of like the note has cooties or something because Patsy didn't touch it. John just moved it to the floor and then I guess the police didn't pick it up and read it when they first got there. And to me, it seems like that's the most important thing to find out what the kidnapper wants. Now, looking at this map, the blue arrow is pointing where John Fernie's house used to be, and the blue circle is where the Ramsey's house was in 1996. And you can see that it's a 10 to 15 minute drive, at least, to the Ramsey's house. Fleet and Priscilla White were there when I arrived. 
and my wife came shortly thereafter, and our overstock, our priest, came afterwards as well. Now, after Barbara Fernie had arrived and was there a while, she became concerned about Burke Ramsey being all alone up in his bedroom while the police and everybody else was on the first floor. Because if you remember, if she got there about 6.30, it wasn't until after 7 that Burke left. So he was up there alone. And she felt like he would have been awake with all the commotion going on downstairs and everybody just leaving him to himself up there. My recollection is that later in the day, when we were waiting for phone calls from the supposed kidnappers, we were sitting in the back room with the detective and trying to figure out what the note meant. And there was a copy of the note. I don't know if it was the note or a copy of the note, actually. Now, during the course of that tragic day, at least you, Mrs. White, yourself, had occasion to view and read the note and talk about some of the issues concerning it. Is that correct? I believe so. Did you receive, were there police officers there that day? Yes. And were you talking to police officers during the course of that day? Yes, occasionally. Here are my thoughts are that this obviously reading the ransom note together, Fleet White, John Fernie, and John Ramsey, and others, took place later in the day, either during the, at the earliest, during the time that the phone call was supposed to come in, or after the phone call did not come in at 10 a.m. And it was reported that John Ramsey didn't offer very much insight into the ransom note. Fleet talked about it. John Fernie might have talked about it. But John Ramsey didn't say much at all. Sometime that morning, I remember a day back in the summer when I had left my keys inside and was locked out of the house. To get in, I broke one of the panes in a basement window. Then I reached in and released the latch so I could climb inside. I think about that basement now. I jump up and hurry down there. That entry place needs to be looked at, I tell myself. I move down the basement hall and find the window. The pane is still broken and the window is open with a large old Samsonite suitcase sitting right underneath it, under it. Odd, I think. This doesn't look right. The suitcase is not normally kept here. Maybe this is how the kidnapper got in and out of our house. The window ledge is a few feet off the floor, so a person would need something to stand on in order to get up and out. I don't believe this took place. I believe John Ramsey added this in later because during his police interview, he said he was down there in the basement, but I think he was in the basement before they called 911. And so he was trapped because no one recalls him going down to the basement. And so he testified that he went down into the basement. And so he was in a, a conundrum and he didn't, he had to make this up. Now, sometime after 1 p.m., John Ramsey, Fleet White, and John Fernie went looking around the house to see if they could find anything unusual or out of place. But in 
John Ramsey's book, The Death of Innocence, he doesn't mention John Fernie going with them. Fleet White is standing next to me, so I ask him to go with me. Fleet is my friend and a father himself. Fleet can help. Now, in this newspaper article, written about six months afterwards, it states, Police reported early in the case that John Ramsey found his daughter's body while searching the house with a family friend, Fleet White. In fact, there were two friends, Fleet White, a retired oil company executive who lived in the Ramsey's neighborhood, and John Fernie. Now, in this newspaper article, it reaffirms that John Fernie was there, and it's about the grand jury testimony. According to court documents, John Fernie accompanied John Ramsey and family friend Fleet White to the Ramsey basement the afternoon of December 26, 1996, after Detective Linda Arndt suggested the men scoured the house for anything that might be amiss. My thoughts here are Fleet White was being much more helpful for John Ramsey and was kind of doing everything that John Ramsey wanted. And so he kind of left out John Fernie. So he might have been trailing behind. He wasn't as close but he was down in the basement, I believe, when John Bonet's body was found. Now here, when John Ramsey was asked about friends, he replied, friends, they typically revolved around children. John and Barbara Fernie, Fleet and Priscilla White, Larry and Pinky Barber, I think those are probably our three. The top of your list? Yeah. At this moment in this video, I would like to mention Luke Fernie. That was John Fernie's son, and he was one year older than Burke, and they weren't real good friends. Burke Ramsey was friends with Fleet White Jr., who was two years younger than him. And he's pictured in this photograph in front of Burke. I'm not sure which kid. Now, after John Ramsey called his pilot about getting a flight out of town to Atlanta, and the police told him, you can't leave, John Fernie offered for the Ramseys to stay at his house. And so the Ramseys stayed the night, the December 26th, at John and Barbara Fernie's house. I think at the time of this incident, John Fernie was John Ramsey's best friend, whether he realized it or not. And, um... I think while he might have stuttered when he was giving the answer to the question of what he remembered about the phone call early that morning, he was um, doing what I'm doing. doing. Um, he didn't want to say something that would incriminate John. He was trying to be nice, and so he didn't know what, how to answer that question with the interviewer. And I think John Fernie was always kind of behind what was going on, where Fleet White was very reactive and involved. John Fernie was kind of mystified and didn't really understand what was going on the whole time. I wanted to explain how we got John Fernie's testimony. So, the John Bonet murder was national news, and tabloids were writing articles about it all the time. 
So a Boulder lawyer named Thomas C. Miller was accused of bribery, trying to obtain the ransom note before that had been released. And there was a court case and one of the witnesses that was called was John Fernie. And so that's how we get this information. And ultimately, in that case, the man, the gentleman was acquitted. The jury did not believe that he engaged in anything inappropriately or against the law, I should say. You have been watching a Nancy Drew show. Please consider subscribing to my channel. Well, this ends this episode of Unsolved. And in this episode, John Fernie does some odd things and doesn't remember well. But I don't suspect him of any wrongdoing. I did an episode on the three faces of Fernie with three different scenarios. He's innocent, he got mixed up in this, and then he's guilty. And I think it's more the Ramses used him, and that's why there's some confusion. And the Ramses did part ways with the Fernies. So I'll see you the next time.